let us talk about Dynamite June 14th, 2023. But first, news and notes. Let's start with the craziest news first. Uh, BJ Whitmer, who was, a, who was an agent at uh, AEW, was fired for domestic violence charges. So this is from Fightful. It says the AEW producer was arrested on the evening of June 4th by Boone County Sheriff Department in Boone County, Kentucky. Wimmer has been charged with strangulation in the first degree and burglary in the second degree. Ooh. Of course, AEW fired him immediately after this. Uh, BJ Whitmer is a, was a former wrestler for Ring of Honor. Um, he's, <laughs> I don't know if he's well known for this, but he's pretty known for his wife, Kelly Klein, to be having a secret affair with Joey Mercury behind his back. It all blew up. When uh, Kelly Klein did an interview for Newsweek and she nuked Ring of Honor from orbit, talking about um, how terrible the facilities were and how they didn't have medical teams and stuff like this. It ended up being a r real nasty separation between Kelly Klein and Ring of Honor. And then we found out from that that she had been talking to Joey Mercury. And everybody was like, hey, how does she, how does Joey Mercury know everything about Kelly Klein? And then it, of course, came out later that she was. Uh, stopping uh joey mercury and she was married to bj whitmer at the time so i think this guy has just been having a rough time you know it's been real terrible but he never became anything as a wrestler he was a wrestler but he never really became anything so you know it sucks if he did this stuff he should go to jail for sure if he didn't though i don't know what can you do all right this is a uh, Tony Khan did a series of interviews. Here's one where he answered, uh, talked, uh, answered a question about collisions, poor ticket sales. He says, I think really with these collision events, people don't know what to expect. We've got a really strong number for the show in Chicago. That's going to turn out to be one of our best TVs we've done all year, which is saying nothing. People don't know what to expect. They expect AEW. That's why they're not paying to show up. What on earth? What do you mean? We're not talking about something that people have no earthly idea what it's going to be. You know, your fan base is on the internet and they talk about this stuff endlessly. They know what collision is. They're pretty sure about the product. It's been going on for four years. You're not going to have... Uh, people unsure about AEW. Like, that's a ridiculous response. Now, here's the response that he had to questions about a brand split. I am going to feature certain talent on certain shows, but I haven't drawn any hard lines or locked us into any kind of split of a roster. I think people are going to be featured on certain shows, but I also think that gives us a great opportunity to showcase certain wrestlers on both Dynamite and Collision at certain times and certain stories that can cross the shows. I think the champions of AEW will be the champions on every show and, frankly, every promotion in the world. We're not shy about AEW wrestlers going out and taking on the top stars, top competition from other companies. Again, the, the, the end of this statement has nothing to do with the question. <laughs> so he basically does. He basically says we're going to do the WWE model. There's going to be some stories that are going to go across brands like the bloodline or uh, some other type of stories that WWE would do. But generally speaking, there will be people who are going to be brand specific. And I'm thinking, you know, the CM Punk, El Gerardi, El Idolo, look at me. They're going, they're going, those guys are going to be uh, brand specific, Miro, guys like this. And there's going to be people who maybe they're not uh in the in the heat camp they'll be they'll go back and forth you know so it's pretty much exactly a wwe system which is what we which is what i kind of expected um because while they have a big enough roster to do a brand split you often see this already with ring of honor where they they just go back and forth you know there's some people who are on ring of honor they they, they rarely make dynamite and then there's people who are on Ring of Honor that are probably never going to see Dynamite. So, or Rampage. So, there that is. So, I really didn't see this as being a, a controversial answer to the question. It just seemed pretty safe, if we're being honest. Now, a bunch of people really got on, got on my head for not addressing the Orange Cassidy Undertaker thing. So, I'm going to do it right here. It is 
a bizarre statement. Not everything deserves my time, but let's go into it because I do want to give some thoughts. Matt Hardy says, I'm going to make a very strange connection, but I do think there's some truth to this. In some ways right now, if you notice this, Orange Cassidy opens up Dynamite all the time. I feel like Orange Cassidy to Tony at this stage right now, where they're currently at these last few months, in some ways reminds me of the relationship between Vince McMahon and The Undertaker. He was his go-to guy, a guy that he knew could go out and get the job done. On top of that, those guys were both really good wrestlers, but they played outlandish, over-the-top gimmicks. So there's a similarity there. Imagine that, hearing Orange Cassidy compared to The Undertaker. So because I understood what Matt Hardy was coming from here in terms of a go-to guy, which is literally in the statement, I didn't get too upset about it. I mean, every every company has their go-to guys. He's not saying they're on the same level or Orange Cassidy is as great as The Undertaker. He's basically saying Undertaker as to Vince McMahon, Orange Cassidy as to Tony Khan. Basically, if Tony Khan has one guy that he trusts that he can go to for a good segment or what he thinks is a good segment, it's Orange Cassidy. Just like, you know, Vince always trusted Undertaker. Tony Khan trusts Orange Cassidy. To me, it wasn't worthy of the outrage that it got. I know some people only read the headline and they blew their lid. But I just looked at it and said, Matt's doing the best he can to put over Orange Cassidy's relationship with Tony Khan. He wasn't trying to uh, elevate Orange Cassidy to a, a ridiculous level. He was just saying so that people can understand if you if there's a go to guy, you know, a, a sort of um, talent that Tony Khan trusts more than anybody else, it's Orange Cassidy. Now, we can all agree that that's wrong. And it is indeed wrong. He shouldn't trust Orange Cassidy more than anybody. But, I mean, he does. So, it's, it's very odd. So, here's another thing. We're going to talk about this. Vince Russo truly believes that Tony Khan is going to end up buying the Turner Networks from Warner Brothers Discovery. So... We got to we got to do the voice and everything. We can't just half ass a Vince Russo quote. Tony Khan is buying the television time, bro. End of story, period, bro. This is a billionaire, bro. Money is not an object, bro. And he is paying. He is paying TBS and TNT more money, bro. More money than they couldn't make in advertising for those shows, bro. He is paying TBS and TNT more money than they could make in advertising for those shows, bro. I walked with television executives, bro. I was walking with freaking USA Network a year ago, bro. A year ago, bro. I was having conversations with the running USA Network. You are not going to reward a franchise, bro. You're not going to reward a franchise, bro, when you have a history of ratings that continue to go down, bro. Okay. So, Vince Russo believes that Tony Khan is buying television time. It's a conspiracy theory that I've been, you know, playing around with for a little while myself. I actually thought this. Um, look, we know that it happens. It used to happen a lot in the territory days. It happened a little bit less in the 90s, but it was still happening. Uh, when there was used to be in Florida called the Sunshine Network, uh, one of the debtors for ECW was the Sunshine Network. Basically, ECW was paying to be on television in Florida, even though they really didn't even run shows in Florida. So <laughs> they were paying to have their show go in other places to help you know, broaden the, the fan base. And there has been talks that uh, TNA was buying time for Fox Sportsnet. That's how that got how that deal happened. So people have been talking about this for a while. That Warner Brothers Discovery probably needs money, and therefore, 
they might be having playing footsie with Tony Khan. Now, Tony Khan has repeatedly said that David Zaslav, the CEO of Warner Brothers Discovery, personally asked him for collision, but there was no, no, no talk of a new deal. And I have definitely been, uh, let's say, suspicious about that. It's been very suspicious that AEW gets a brand new show completely out of nowhere. While Dynamite struggles in the ratings, while Rampage does little to nothing at all, while Battle of the Belts does little to nothing at all, okay, uh, in the ratings, that they would gift Tony Khan with more time. Now, this is a logical position. Vince Russo might not be, you know, uh, the smartest guy in the room, the sharpest tool in the shed, the sharpest knife in the knife box. But he might be on to something with this one. Now, Tony Khan has, uh, he's not going to respond to this, obviously. But he claimed that Warner Brothers Discovery was committed to AEW when he was questioned about uh, Warner Brothers Discovery quite possibly being in the WWE business. Saying, that, oh yeah, they gave us this extra show because they're so committed to AEW. I believe that there's a good relationship between there. It's like, well, you, where is the new deal? Where is it? How do you get more work but not more money? I don't I don't understand that. And why would you go for that? Who's paying for it? <laughs> like that's that's what I'm trying to figure out. It's just so much shadowy business going on here. But Vince Russo was on to something. I think he's got his nose to the ground. But it's not like he has any friends in AEW who's gonna tell him stuff. So it's gonna definitely come across like a conspiracy theorist. And I'm pretty sure this is a something that only really bounces around on our side of wrestling media. The people who talk uh, critically about these issues. So I definitely think it's something to consider. But I don't think it's something you can say for sure. And since Vince Russo is the one saying it, eh, I think we should uh, take it with a little, a little bit of a grain of salt. But it is interesting. Let's get into Dynamite. Um, oh my goodness. All right, MJF versus Adam Cole ends in a 30-minute time limit draw. You know what? I don't hate the idea of it being a time limit draw. What I didn't like is that they seemingly threw everything possible at this match and left almost nothing for the rematch. Because you know the rematch is coming. But it didn't seem like they left much on the table. There was an elbow drop through a table from the top rope. There's a tombstone pile driver on the ring apron. They did an Eddie Guerrero spot in which MJF actually blew it because the referee didn't see him throw the belt to uh, Adam Cole. Uh, that was that should have been the finish if, if we're being honest. Let's let's slow down a little bit. To talk about that. So the spot goes that the referee takes the bump. Uh, MJF goes outside the ring, gets the AEW World Title. He. You know, the referee starting to wake up and come to, he tosses the belt to Adam Cole and then lays down. Now, because the referee is still dizzy, he takes another bump and he goes down. And now Adam Cole just has the belt in his hand, you know, uh, and he takes the opportunity to hit MJF with it. And then he hits him, I think, with his finisher or something like that. And it wasn't the finish. And this was like a high spot in the match in terms of, the crowd reaction, people were really, really hot for this spot. And they didn't end it here. They just kept going. So uh, another big finishing spot was at the very end. MJF puts on the Dynamite Diamond Ring uh, behind the referee's back. He's about to punch Adam Cole with it. But referee turns around just in time to see the ring, snatches it away from him. Adam Cole takes the opportunity to do his finishing sequence only for the refer only for the uh, bell to ring before Adam Cole wins the match. Uh, so the match went to a 30 minute time limit draw. Adam Cole wants five more minutes. Of course, MJF refuses. And that's how we end this. Uh, okay. Look, I don't hate the idea of a time limit draw. I hate that they did so much in this match. 
Because it's almost like, what are they going to do in the next match? Because it has to be another match. Uh, I like the, the simple wrestling part of the show, which is really good when it comes to MJF. He's going to make sure he get his uh, simple wrestling stuff in. I mean, working an arm, very simple storytelling. Um, some of the other over-the-top things that they did, like, you know, uh, suplexing each other on the ring apron, very unnecessary. Um, of course, the casual no-selling by Adam Cole, especially at the end. MJF was doing more selling at the end than Adam Cole was. Um, MJF, some people got really kind of tight assed about MJF going outside the ring and, you know, smacking that guy's hat off his head or whatever. That guy was a dork. He probably loved it. You know, he probably thought it was great. He probably, you know, you know, jizzed himself or something like that. I wouldn't be too concerned with it. No, should he be putting his hands on, on fans? No. But you got to consider he knows his audience. He knows this fan, this this fan base would love to be part of the show. This is uh, the ECW fan base. They don't really sue, you know. They're like, oh my god, did you see me on TV, mom? I'm like, yeah, I saw you, sweetheart. You know. <laughs> anyway, um, not beating MJF. I I guess it's okay. This was non-title. So I guess it was all right, but it wouldn't have made a big deal if Adam Cole would have won, you know, especially if he'd have hit him with the belt first, you know, would have gave MJF an out. And why even do this? That's what I want to know. I'm trying to figure out why even have a, if especially if you're going to end it in a time limit draw, should have just been a title match. But I know some people will say, well, the title matches are 60 minutes. Well, that's fine. Because the rest of this show was shysa. So you can might as well have thrown, thrown another 30 minutes on this joint. Now, I'm not going to hold you up. I don't think a match needs to be an hour, ever. Which is why I kind of suggested that MJF should either got disqualified or MJF should have got should have got pinned. And what better way to make Adam Cole a, a top-tier contender than to have him pin MJF? You know? To me, it, you, you can do things strategically that makes sense. And I think Adam Cole winning this match after MJF has the Vince, his, uh, Vince's right stuff on the armband and after the big promo last week where he said M Adam Cole didn't have it anymore, it would have made storyline sense for Adam Cole to beat MJF in a non-title match, even with a little bit of help, and set up the next match. But they didn't. They didn't go that route. I don't understand why. But whatever. Probably because of Forbidden Door. So MJF's opponent for Forbidden Door is going to be Hiroshi Tanahashi. Uh, Tanahashi's. I love Japan. I love the Japanese guys because they because they are so colorful in their phrasing. Unfortunately, it's uh, it's in a foreign language, so you don't really understand it. But he said, as long as MJF has that championship, it won't shine right or something like that. And I thought, like, man, that's, that's something fucked up to say to somebody who's a world champion. The belt does not shine the way that it should in your possession. You're like, wow, what are you trying to say? You trying to say I'm dirty? You trying to say I'm filthy? Uh, MJF, upon hearing about this, said that he is going to be a big fat no from him because he's not going to defend the championship against some indie wrestler from a rinky-dink promotion. Of course, that pissed off a lot of the, the AEW fans who think that, you know, New Japan invented oxygen. So, I hate that Tanahashi's in this position, that he's going to be, like, the guy putting people over. Because he did this last year. But he's in the tail end of his career. It doesn't make much of a difference to him, you know. And it'll be great for MJF. So, okay, cool. And I think it would have been a nice little bounce back match if... Adam Cole would have won this match in, let's say, 15 minutes. And, you know, MJF was furious, and then he beats Tanahashi and kind of gets the swagger back. And, um, but to me, it just feels like MJF being a little chicken shit heel, you can, you can beat that guy every once in a while, you know? And I'm not saying I would have had Ricky Starks beat him, but I'm saying Adam Cole is in a position where he feuded with Hangman Page and literally got nowhere. You know, he never won a match in that feud. 
he needed a big win. Like he needed this win to take him to the next level. Instead, you just 50 50 it, you know, he had the match one, but really he was losing most of the match anyway. So it's like he got hot at the wrong moment. But they're really putting some effort into MJF being a, a guy who wrestles long matches, which isn't necessary, if we're being honest. But, okay, sure. So, I guess we'll have to wait maybe, what, Forbidden Boar, Forbidden, Forbidden Boar is in two weeks. So, I'm guessing after that, we'll figure this out. They had a CM Punk vignette where the only thing that is certain is the uncertainty. He came back to, he's coming back to AEW for the same reason he came there in the first place. He got scores to settle. He doesn't know what he's going to say, but he has a lot to get off of his chest. And it's just going to be more probably CM Punk baby facing himself. Uh, who, who cares really? Uh, they did a vignette for the six man tag too, in which uh, Jay White talked about the Bang Bang Gang, which I, I, I think is very entertaining. And uh, we actually was subjected to Juice Robinson speaking words at us, which is, I don't think we deserve. But I'm not the one writing the show. Apparently, Tony Khan thinks that we deserve Juice Robinson. Um, it's not fair. You know, what did we ever do to Tony Khan? Some of y'all actually gave him money. And this is how he treats you. Remember that when he asks you for money next time. All right, Sammy Guevara comes out there. I don't understand why Sammy Guevara's graphic has his tongue out. Like, what what is going on? He looks like somebody out of American Pie. I dislike Sammy Guevara. Strongly dislike Sammy Guevara. So, Sammy Guevara talks about needing to make changes in AEW. He's immediately interrupted by Darby Allin. Darby Allen said that the crowd is starting to love him again, but the question is, is he going to be standing on his own or is he going to be hiding behind the Jericho Appreciation Society? Jericho comes out, tells Darby Allen to mind his business, then turns to Sammy Guevara and says, for three months, you were chasing the world title. You never called me once. If you had called me and can ask for my advice, you would be the AEW world champion. Sammy Guevara says, well... If you would have called me, you wouldn't have lost to Adam Cole twice. So they got into each other's faces. Chris Jericho demanded an apology. Sammy Guevara says he didn't apologize for shit. Then, for some reason, uh, Darby Allen got in the middle of this and said that Jericho calls himself a wizard, but the magic is gone. Chris Jericho then referred to Darby Allen as a morose mutant. And then said that both of them, but meaning him and Sammy Guevara, were going to stomp Darby Allen out. To which Darby Allen said he wasn't alone. And Sting came out there. So Sting and Jericho had a face-off, which I think is the first ever face-off between Jericho and Sting. They both have bats because Jericho is ripping off Sting's gimmick. They both poked each other in the chin with each other's bats. You know, paws, by the way. And Jericho eventually backed off before leaving the arena. So, they're teasing Sting and Jericho. They're teasing the breakup of Sammy Guevara and the uh, Jericho Appreciation Society. Okay. Um, I, I don't really have much against any of this except Sammy Guevara shouldn't be talking. I, I could take it to the next level and say Sammy Guevara shouldn't exist. But... Since he does, he could at least not talk. Um, but they're having him stand up for to Chris Jericho now, which they probably are probably like a year or two over. They should have done this back when the inner circle was a thing. You remember that time when Sammy Guevara stormed out if, you know, when he was mad at MJF? He should have went his own way then, but they chose not to do that. He just doubled back and he came right back under Jericho's wing. Now they're teasing that Sammy Guevara is finally a man. Now that he's going to have a baby, a baby girl. He's a man now, and he's not going to take Jericho's shit. Okay, maybe. But they're teasing a tag team match in which Sammy Guevara and Jericho are not really on good terms. But, okay. The, the idea of Jericho wrestling Sting has been pushed around since, I think, Sting came to AEW. 
Chris Jericho, of course, recently tried to throw everybody off the scent by saying he has no interest in working with Sting. And the very same week, the two of them have a stare down in the ring. He has no interest working with Sting. He probably has no interest working in a singles match with Sting. <laughs> but he certainly has interest working with Sting. Jericho wants to put himself on Sting's uh, platform. And uh, to me, it's fun. I like the idea of Jericho and Sting. I don't like the idea of it being a closeted Sammy Guevara push, but I, I'll take it if you know we can get some Jericho Sting stuff just for the nostalgia factor. The nostalgia factor is 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 good enough for me. I'll take I'll take the L on this one. And I know a lot of people are going to be like, "How could you? These are two dinosaurs." Like, yeah, but the young guys are garbage. I mean, Darby Allen, look, athletically, he's perfectly fine, but the kid is a stick figure with a death wish. I don't understand what's going on with him. And Sammy Guevara is just not fit, fit for public consumption. I mean, he's literally TV poison. I don't know why they would choose to do that. But it's, I guess it's better than uh, Sting and Jericho straight up, which... I'm pretty sure knees would pop out of place, backs would turn into dust, and both of them would be in a heat four minutes into the match. All right, this led to the, the ten, six man tag, eight man tag. How many, many men was in this match? Darby Allen, Sting, Keasley, and Orange Cassidy versus the Mogul Embassy, which included Bishop Khan, Swerve Strickland, Brian Cage, and Toa Leona. Now, Brian Cage comes out there and he is wearing face paint and long tights. I have no idea why he's dressed this way. I I did peek on the internet because I was very confused. I thought maybe they, he had done something on Ring of Honor where he changed his gimmick. But apparently he's just a fan of Sting and decided he was going to Sting cosplay in this match. Which will also explain why he took the pin. Which uh, came from a scorpion death drop onto Brian Cage. So Brian Cage is such a fan of Sting that he cosplayed his opponent, took his opponent's finisher, and then got pinned. Brian Cage is worthless, bro. I mean, he's absolutely worthless. He is not a professional. He is not a professional, bro. I am deeply offended by the idea that Brian Cage is a professional wrestler. He is a mark puffed up on steroids and it is absolutely shameful behavior that like, and this good, and this went completely unmentioned by anybody. Swerve, who was apparently his cafe boss said nothing. I'm, I'm just saying like, why? Like this dude shows up randomly wearing face paint, randomly wearing long tights. And I'm like, is this Road Warrior Cage? And then I'm like, oh no, this is Toad Warrior Cage. This guy is, you ain't, you ain't no hawk. You ain't no animal. You ain't even a member of Demolition. You're not a member of Powers of Pain. You're not even, <laughs> you're a renegade level. All right. This dude fucking sucks. And the sooner we can get rid of him, the better. Oh my God. This is the, he is a walking poster board for steroids can't help everybody because he needs steroids of the brain because his brain is rotten. It's like literally rotted inside out. He is two different kinds of stupid. Uh, oh, Jesus Christ. This match was, was dumb anyway. So uh, Daniel Garcia was watching this match. He was very unimpressed. I was also very unimpressed. I was very tired from that 30 minute match. I didn't really want to watch the rest of this show. I was like, okay, 30 minute draw, huh? All right. So nothing's going to be able to top this and nothing did. Uh, during this match, there was a big no that popped on the screen. A lot of people have been uh, tripping about that. Um, we're unsure whether it was a production error or whether it was part of an angle or something like that, but it was a big, no on the screen and it seemed like came out of nowhere and didn't really have any context to it like they were in the ring and they were about to start doing the spot where uh sting splashes a bunch of people so i don't know i guess we'll have to see if something develops from it but 
AEW is not exactly known for, you know, developing things that they tease on television. So Orange Cassidy was in this match. He won the match. Uh, well, he helped win. Of course, he has no match for Forbidden Door. And they ask him about it. And of course, he, you know, breaking the fourth wall is like, oh, I'm sure somebody's going to come out here and challenge me. And it is uh, Zack Sabre Jr. And I just, oh, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Zack Sabre Jr. is the most room temperature pro wrestler there ever has been. I mean, for you to be a fan of his, you cannot like any flavor, nothing too hot, nothing too cold. It's all missionary sex and vanilla ice cream. You know, it's, oh, this guy. Oh, oh no. Oh, no. That one's going to be a, a, a tough thing to sit through. Then Daniel Garcia showed up, which made this even worse. And somehow this became a tag team match between Orange Cassidy and Shibata versus Zack Sabre Jr. and Daniel Garcia for next week. And I was like, oh my God, they're not going to even wait to ruin our lives. They're going to ruin our lives as soon as possible. So, uh, I know that a lot of the, the wrestling media loves us from Katsuyori Shibata, but, uh, post brain operation Shibata, I'm just, I mean, he's okay, but let's be real about it. He, he has, of course, is not nearly where he used to be. Who the man who is on top of his game, though, the proper world's champion, Sonata, uh, put out an open challenge for Forbidden Door. And I was very excited about this. I'm like, ah, oh, Sonata, Sonata rules. I've been saying Sonata rules for like four years. You know, finally, he looks the part. He carries himself like a champion. I mean, look at the guy. He looks like he drives a Cadillac. He looks like a man worth something. You know, it's just the epitome of world champion. I love Sonata. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, what are they going to do? And then they later in the show, they have Jungle Boy answer the open challenge. I, oh, oh, oh. Jungle Boy versus Sonata. Jesus Christ. Why would New Japan even agree to that? Of all the guys you got on your roster, for our world champion to beat. You choose Jack Perry. What? That's offensive, bro. It, it's got to be offensive, right? Like you, you, you offering up Tanahashi for the, for the, for the slaughter, but you couldn't give us, you know, nobody that's of a proper level to wrestle. You couldn't give me like Hangman Page. I mean, I know Hangman Page probably was last year. He's one of the three guys they wrestled for the uh, title last year. But you couldn't give me like a Hangman Page. You know, you couldn't give me you know, a Claudio, somebody that's higher up on the roster. I had to get the Dregs, the the guy with the pride shirt. You know, and then this guy now his his best friend is Hook now. Because they've been seen in public a few times, they're best friends. I'm uh, mm -mm. get this teen beat shit out of here. This doesn't work when you don't have a female audience, all right. But then again, like I said, the pride shirt—they know their audience very well. You know, <laughs> I'm not tripping on the pride shirt. I'm just saying they specifically went with Jungle Hook to be the rainbow shirt of the month, right? So they did that for a reason. They know the kind of people who are interested in Jungle Hook. <laughs> and it ain't it ain't full grown adults. I can tell you that. Well, I shouldn't say that. I hope they're full grown adults. Uh but this is gonna suck. I have zero interest in in Jack Perry versus Sonata. I really would would have preferred to watch Sonata wrestle somebody who's on the upper echelon of AEW. But Tony Khan is really protecting those guys. He doesn't want any of his guys to do the job. And it seems goofy that, you know, whatever. Let's move on. The guns, they are very vague about whether they're joining Bullet Club Gold or not. But then they said that they're the best brother tag team. And they challenged the Hardys because the Hardys are old and washed. And they want to defeat them next week on uh, Dynamite. 
to which I almost wrote down the Hardy still work here because they don't do anything. Uh, but I for always forget the Hardys are here until somebody mentioned them. Then I'm like, Oh yeah, the Hardys do work here. You know, they're just so unimportant to the rest of the roster. You know, it's, it's just so unimportant. If you're going to, let's say, you know, the a, new Japan is offering up Tanahashi. You could offer up Jeff Hardy to wrestle Sonata. Why not? You think people, I think people would have been excited for that. You know, a Jeff Hardy singles match versus Sonata. That would have been fun. You know, I think that people, it'd have been, you know, unexpected. But Jungle Boy, get out of here, man. Come on. TNT Championship, Warlow versus Jake Hager. I was uh, I was told that Jake Hager has yet to win a singles match in AEW. Is that true? Is it true that Jake Hager has never won a singles match in AEW in four years? If that's true, then that's unreal. I think that's like Brooklyn Brawler or Iron Mike Sharp status. That's uh, Barry Horowitz status. <laughs> anyway, uh, the match was boring because it was Jake Hager. Warlow wins with two power bombs. Now the crowd still likes the power bomb symphony, which has been the one thing that's been saving uh, Warlow's bacon. Is that people are still getting amped for the power bomb symphony? So after the first one, they standing up and he starts shaking the ropes and everything is great. The crowd really gets into it. But this match was absolutely abysmal. You you had Arn Anderson stop 2.0 as they tried to interfere. And he's playing with his, his imaginary gun in his imaginary holster inside of his jacket. And 2.0 is just standing there waiting for this 70-some-odd-year-old man to pull an imaginary gun out of his imaginary holster inside of his jacket. And I'm like, what in the fuck? Why is this? I would think that Arn Anderson with his history in the business and his knowledge and his mind for the business would know better than to let your gimmick be some kind of invisible weapon. Okay. It's, I get it. It's supposed it's over with the people. But please, you know, you're st I know that 2.0 is a joke. They're not a real threat. But please, please don't do this. It doesn't make sense. I didn't see who came out there to help him, and I don't care. But uh, Arn Anderson and some other guy beat up 2.0 to the back. Then Christian and Luchasaurus, they got on the screen. There was audio issues, so we didn't really hear what... Uh, Christian said, I guess they replayed it where essentially Christian accepted the, the challenge from Wardlow um, on Luchasaurus's behalf. So Luchasaurus will be the guy wrestling for the TNT title. Then he says, what's going to happen when your new daddy is not there to save you? And he steps aside to see Arn Anderson bloody as hell on the stairs. It was, it was pretty wild. You know, that was a lot of blood for Arn Anderson. You could tell it was pre-taped. But um, fine, I guess. Look, I, I'm over it. Warlow is, is really damaged goods. You know, he really needs some, some to be crushing some guy. I don't know if you can go back to doing what he was doing, but they need to do something. You know, him working legit matches against Jake Hager and Luchasaurus is not doing him any favors. He should crush Luchasaurus. I'm talking he should get in the ring and 42 seconds. He's a six power bomb that asshole. Power bomb him six times. Power bomb him until people are feeling bad for him. That's what I would do. I would power bomb him until the ref stopped the match. Like Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. That's how you should end the Luchasaurus Warlow match. He should just power bomb that fool until he's not moving. And until the referee steps in and is like, no, 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 stop it. It's over. And it should be less than 10 minutes. It should be less than six minutes. It should be almost immediately in order to put over how strong and powerful and pissed off Wardlow is. But they're not going to do that because the AEW doesn't have any idea how to book people that strongly. Match four, Sky Blue versus Tony Storm for the AEW Women's Championship. 
Uh, Sky Blue, uh, beautiful girl, no personality. She has some fire here, though, um, especially after Tony Storm and Sky, uh, Ruby Soho sprayed uh, Sky Blue's mom in the face with spray paint. Uh, they did a nice little uh, false finish where Sky Blue actually sprayed Tony Storm in the face and then hit her with a super kick. And then she actually landed her finish. So, um, but ref, uh, Ruby pulled the ref out, so he didn't see the finish. Uh, Sky Blue also kicked out of Tony Storm's finish the first time. So they really was kind of building up, making people believe that Sky Blue was going to win, but you would have to be, you know, the gold. <laughs> you have to win the gold medal in the Special Olympics to believe that Sky Blue is going to win this title. Anyway, uh, Tony Storm wins. Sky Blue is then attacked after the match. Willow Nightingale runs down there to help her. It's going to be a tag team match on Collision. It's already Rampage because that they're starting to do the exact same thing. You're going to have storyline start on Dynamite and then immediately go over to Rampage. Um, sorry, Collision, but that's basically Rampage. You know, uh, Tony Storm. Let's talk about Tony Storm for a second because Tony Storm is, is she's back in the bakery. You know. She's back in, like, you know, she went to WWE and they put her out of business, you know, a little bit. She's still nice, but they put her out of business. But uh, she's back in her bag. You know, she's getting she's getting a little hefty back there. You know what I'm talking about. Don't pretend you don't. You know what I'm talking about. Um, that girl back there baking buns, you feel me? Anyway, um, this uh, Willow Nightingale stuff. Okay, just pull the trigger. Let's let's just go with it, I guess. Because she's been on Ring of Honor, I think, and she's been on here. I don't know which way the direction they're going to go with it, but they want to probably give her an AEW belt. I'm not sure which one it's going to be, though. It'll probably be the Ring of Honor belt, if anything, because that's what they seem to think about when it comes to uh, women. Uh, and in the main event was an absolute cluster. The Blackpool Combat Club versus the Young Bucks and Hangman Page. So uh, Yuta takes the pin after two or three weeks of Yuta being invincible, and he's he pinned Kenny Omega, and he's a he's a winner. He gets beat by Hangman Page. Then we get the cluster because now we got the post match attack, in which Eddie Kingston storms the ring. The people just absolutely erupt because they love Eddie Kingston. He attacks Claudio uh, because that's his that's been the guy he was feuding with in Ring of Honor. And you have to watch this show to know that. Uh, he then stares down Moxley, but him and Moxley are still friends. The Young Bucks jump John Moxley, and Eddie Kingston actually pulled the Young Bucks off of John Moxley. Then Tanosuke Takeshita runs to the ring, and he takes down Eddie Kingston. Kenny Omega runs to the ring to fight Takeshita. Once Takeshita takes a bump and rolls out of the ring, Will Ospreay attacks Kenny Omega from behind, and this is how we go off the show with Will Ospreay, who doesn't work there and hasn't been featured, is the guy standing tall at the end of the show. Instead of it either being Tikeshta or, you know, in retreat or, you know, Kenny Omega on his back, which would have made perfect sense. AEW decided to go overboard with Will Ospreay. Look, we didn't even really need Eddie Kingston, you know. Um, I, the crowd likes Eddie Kingston. I like Eddie Kingston. The, the place blew up when he came out there, but we, I don't think we needed all of these run-ins. You know, I hate when they stack run-ins in any way because you do nothing but step on what's going on in the ring because there's a lot of shit going on in the ring. And then all of a sudden here comes somebody else running out. Then here comes somebody else running out. Yeah, here comes somebody else running out. And you're like, oh my God, can I pay attention to what's going on in the ring without worrying about whether somebody else is going to come running from the back? You know? Uh, but to have Kenny Omega return from his excursion with no extra help, he just returns randomly was a bit over the top. I mean, <laughs> it is what it is. I'm not you know, complaining about it, but I thought the point of him leaving was that he was going to get assistance and then he came back empty handed. So, I don't know what's going on anymore. Uh, anyway, as far as Collision is concerned, they announced Miro and Andrade. Oh, look at me. 
look at me. And they actually uh, announced that those two guys will be in action at Collision. So that's great. You know, they're trying to give you something to be interested in. Their opponents are not interesting. Uh, so they're trying, they're putting forth some effort with Collision. We'll see how long that lasts. But uh, this Dynamite, ooh, good crowd reaction. It felt like old school AEW with the crowd. The crowd was really into everything. Uh, well, yeah, they, the crowd was really into everything pretty much all night. It's just what we were looking at was mostly trash. You know, Adam Cole versus MJF was fine. You know, it was a really good long match. Um, I would have had it go a little bit differently, but ultimately, very good match. We knew they could have a good match together. Um, maybe a couple of too many spots. Definitely didn't need the table spot, whatever. Uh, most of the promos weren't hitting, but the Sammy Guevara, Chris Jericho storyline is over a year in the making. They've teased that thing more than once. Uh, Christian usually is very good, but he wasn't given much here. Uh, Arn Anderson is still doing the invisible gun thing, and it makes me dislike him very much. He should know better than that, you know, to, to be doing the invisible gun stuff. It's just goofy, and why do it? Why be bothered with that crap, right? Um, and the main event was a mess. I've seen, I feel like I've seen these guys fight a hundred times. I didn't care. Um, the Eddie Kingston surprise was, was good. I liked that. It was fine. But everything afterwards, I was kind of like, I don't really need that. And I certainly didn't need Will Ospreay. It just felt so busy. Like they were just putting, you know how you make a, uh, a, a Sunday or something, and then you put a cherry on top, and then they decided to put a grape on top of the cherry. Then they decided, well, if I put a blackberry on top of the strawberry, and it's like, okay, look, you know, you, you, you're doing too much, all right? Just leave things as is sometimes, <laughs> you know? You don't, we don't, we didn't need, I mean, Takeshita being out there, I guess, added to the story. Well, if that's the case, save Eddie Kingston's return for collision, all right? We could have done that. Just had Kenny Omega and Takeshita go at it in the ring, and then maybe Will Ospreay comes out there. Didn't need that. Didn't need the bird without wings coming out there. He sucks, by the way. Will Ospreay sucks. He's boring. He's another room temperature pro wrestler. A lot of them seem to be British, right? They're, I'm very good, bro. Look at me do flips, bro. It's like, uh, I really, I'd rather not, you know? I'd rather not. You dig? Like, what happened to Pac? Bring that guy back. What, what happened to that guy? Is he dead? Is he getting open brain surgery? What's happening here? Why go? Let us know. Like, that guy is vastly superior to Will Ospreay. You know, bring him back. I don't want to deal with Will Ospreay. Get him the fuck out of here, please. You know, excuse me. Move him to the side ever so gently. You can have your dream match, whatever, with Kenny Omega in Japan. I have no interest in watching it on American television or North American television at all. I just don't care. Um, so it is a litmus test that, you know, um, this dynamite felt more like the dynamites of the past, you know, maybe the past two or three years more than others. So, if you're a true blue AEW fan, you probably did really like this show. But if you're like me, you're like, okay, I like the first match because, you know, it's a good work rate match. And I actually paid attention to it. So, it was fine. Everything else, though, just felt like shit that people was, you know, reacting to. And I was very disappointed. Watch the DC should be ashamed of themselves. Okay, so we're going to end on this because I didn't really notice it until now. I wasn't paying attention. But apparently Jimmy Jacobs has left Impact Wrestling and has joined AEW as a producer. Now, Jimmy Jacobs is a former producer for WWE. He's also uh, used to work on the creative team. Uh, Jimmy Jacobs was, I guess, responsible for the Kevin Owens Chris Jericho Festival of Friendship segment and all this kind of stuff. But more importantly, this was an idiot who got himself fired because he took a picture with the Young Bucks. Now, let's talk about this. And I'm going to, I didn't want to start the show with this because he's a producer and who cares? You know, he was a wrestler who basically, um, <laughs> I was about to use 
uh, I'm going to go ahead and say he was gay baiting in most of his career. He played like a sissy queerified wrestler or whatever. So uh, here is him getting fired from WWE. This was back in 2022. He says, I was in the arena and I think Kevin Owens texting me, hey, are the Bucks there? I, I hadn't heard anything about it from the inside of the arena. He goes, yeah, I think they're outside. I think they're shooting something. So the Young Bucks are outside the WWE show. They're invading, quote unquote. So he went to go check it out. Um, then he says, uh, so I went out there and holy crap, the Bucks are here. I just saw them and we exchanged pleasantries. And I just, as I was getting ready to leave, I said, hey guys, let's take a picture. And I took a picture, never intending to post it. I was in gorilla position during segment three or four and I just said, screw it. And I posted it. I knew there was a chance people wouldn't like it. I didn't care. I look back at it and I really see it almost like a child acting out. I want to get in trouble. By the way, Jimmy Jacobs in his, is in his late thirties at this point. He's not, he's still not 40 yet, but he's in his late thirties and he's in WWE acting, being like a child acting out. Very bizarre. Very, very bizarre. So this is what got him fired. Uh, he, I think they said he fired him like a week or so later. But in the picture is a Young Bucks, Hangman Page, and Marty Skrull. So um, basically he went and did a year in the doldrums of whatever of Impact. And now the Young Bucks have yet another friend backstage. Every, they're hiring all of their friends. Now uh, the reason why he, he doesn't really care about getting fired is that he claimed that WWE was was too restrictive. That he felt trapped there. Like what? You were on credit. You could have quit. Yeah, uh, this was his uh his statement. I didn't have to think about how I was going to leave ever and feel trapped there. All that sort of stuff, saying that he felt confined in WWE. Oh, this ought to be great! Can't wait to see how how AEW creative turns into uh, with this guy. Ought to be great. <laughs> but he's another ROH guy who you know has found his way into. AEW. I mean, that early 2000s ROH stuff is really poisoning AEW, boy. Yeah, it got it bad. This is like the Black Death. It's full of these guys. And most of them just have no conception of how to produce a wrestling show, how to make compelling television, how to write compelling stories or anything. Even if this guy had a hand in Jericho and Owens, which I'm not sure how much of a of a hand he had. Let's give him some credit for it. That's one storyline, and I don't know how long he was there. He was there for like two or three years, right? So he's where he wants to be, working with his friends. Everybody is sitting around collecting Tony Khan's paychecks. We'll see if it actually translates into more money for Tony Khan. But I don't think so. <laughs> Jimmy Jacobs didn't really do. Did he really do a lot for Impact when he was there? Apparently, from the modicum of research that I did do, he was actually the head of Impact Creative. Which, if that was the case, thank God he's gone because Impact's creative has been the shits for a long time. I've been blaming Scott Demore for how bad Impact's creative is, but if it was him. Then well, you know, good. <laughs> they about to they about to crash Tony Khan's economy. But um, look again this this black death of rejects from Ring of Honor finding their way into AEW and pumping it full of poison. It just continues. I mean, it's perfect for it though. This is this seemingly is the place for those guys. It is absolutely the place for. All of the, the reject indie wrestlers who didn't make it, couldn't make it. And then they are, I feel so constrained by the system, man. I want to be, I want to break free, man. And then they go over to AEW and they quote unquote break free and end up spending more money than they make. Which, you know, when it's your stupid art house film, then you can do that. Which is essentially what AEW is. is basically an art house project full of, you know, uh, theater students who want to be pro wrestlers, but none of them can actually professionally wrestle. But at the same time, though, they did have Adam Cole versus MJF. So you got to give them credit for that.
All right, so that's Dynamite. Uh, news, notes, everything. Uh, I'll talk to you guys later. Uh, we'll be back for Collision, I guess. Peace out.